all of you bright and eager aerolisticians. Uh, let me mention a couple of things by way of announcements. First of all, tomorrow, as a special added attraction, we don't charge you any extra for this. Same low tuition that you are paying now. Or someone's paying for you, more likely. Anyway, uh, John Kim. John Kim uh, started out at Georgia Tech, MIT, spent about 20 years at the Boeing Company, uh, and is now a professor at the National University of Singapore. But uh, he's coming in tomorrow because he's heard how wonderful you all are, and he wants to give a talk. And so he's going to give a talk at noon tomorrow on Friday in this very room. If you show up at 11.30, you get free lunch. Now, I'm not saying that's the primary reason why you should come. But on the other hand, a free lunch and a good talk, hey, at no extra cost, that is a real deal. What is it going to be about? It's going to be about aerial elasticity, <laughs> amazingly enough. It's going to be about nonlinear elasticity. And you will not understand most of what he said. <laughs> But that's okay, because the reason you're taking this course is so that if he were to come back a year from now, and he's been here several times, and is likely to come back again. The next time he comes back, because you've had this course, you'll understand more. I don't say you'll understand everything, but you'll understand more. Uh, but at the, at the beginning, he will probably say some big picture things that you might more or less understand. And then when he gets into the details, well, if you've had, it's all mathematics. Well, I shouldn't say it's all mathematics, but a lot of those are mathematics. Depends on your level of mathematical preparation. Uh, you might understand more. Some of you will understand more, and some will be less. But I will not take, I will not take a poll afterwards. But anyway, he's he's a good uh, fellow. He's doing some interesting work, and uh, so I recommend you show up. So again, he's at the National University of Singapore. And I don't, uh, I'm, I'm going to put uh, Danny on the spot. Uh, would it be possible for these people in Stockholm to see that seminar or at least see the slides? Do you think that's possible? Mm -hmm. we'll try it. Try it. Yeah. Stockholm, we'll get, we, we will try to make the slides available to you. So it will be noon our time, which is what, uh, 6 p.m. in Stockholm? Are you six hours ahead of us or five? Six. 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 Okay, so it'll be 6 p.m. your time. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot provide you with lunch. <laughs> yeah, but but we owe you a lunch. So if you're ever in Durham, remind me and I'll buy you lunch. Okay, uh, so that's John Kim. Now, um, for those of you who are looking at the videos, I'm sure that's everyone. But again, I will not ask for a show of hands. But if you're looking at the videos, you should be looking at videos three and four this week, and I guess five and seven next Five week. and seven, yeah. We think six is missing. But on the other hand, you're getting these live presentations, so I don't ask for any of your tuition back because they missed the video. Um, you will also note, if you are watching the videos, that what I'm presenting in class and what is in the videos, they're not perfectly the same, right? So uh, I do what I think is appropriate given the makeup of this class and what I hear by way of questions. But if you're asking me the question, are you responsible for the material in class or the material in the videos? The answer is yes, right? All of the above and more, because you're also responsible for the material in the book. Anything else that I think I might ask you at some point in time on a quiz or whatever. Okay. I think those are the two announcements I wanted to make. Um, today, I want to say a little bit more about the first homework, which you've all handed in. Most people did a nice job on the first homework. Some were uh, a 
little more perceptive than others, but all of you more or less got the point. But there are a couple of the more subtle points I want to emphasize this morning. So let me do that next. Uh, so let's talk about homework number one. I will answer questions in a moment, but I want to talk about homework number one first. I think everyone derived the equation of motion using Hamilton's principles and Lagrange's equation correctly, and you all got the same answer. That's a good thing, right? That's a good thing. But then, and then, and I think everyone pretty much non-dimensionalized the equations so that it was in the following form eventually. Let's see, I can find my own notes. Yeah, here, you all, you all reached this point. Alpha double dot plus omega alpha squared, one minus Q infinity over Q divergence <coughs> equals Q infinity over Q divergence, omega alpha squared, alpha null. Okay? I think you all got that. And I think you all identified omega alpha and Q divergence. So omega alpha squared, that's all appearance, right? It doesn't, omega alpha itself doesn't appear yet. I'm going to change that in a moment. You only have omega alpha squared, that's K alpha or I alpha. And so this is the, the resonant frequency in the absence of any aerodynamic forces, in the absence of any fluid. Um, and then uh, Q divergence was identified as K alpha over C E times two pi. Whereas uh, Kevin pointed out, K alpha really has to be the spring constant effectively per unit span. Otherwise, the units won't work out properly. I was hoping to sneak that by you, but Kevin caught it. So I, I had to fess up. Okay. Now the question is how do we deduce when divergence occurs? And in particular, if we assume that alpha is alpha bar e to the lambda t, it's not just a matter of computing lambda. I think everyone more or less computed lambda. There was an occasional minus sign dropped or added. But subject to a minus sign, everyone got the expression for lambda. But then some people, I think, really didn't know what that meant. So I want to emphasize what lambda really means. Okay, so let's call this equation one. I'll call these two together equation two, and I'll call this equation three. So let's put equation three into equation one and see what we get. It's a linear equation, right? Uh -oh. I always want to drop that alpha, don't I? There's an alpha there. Sorry about that. Um, What's in my nose? I don't know why. I seems like I always want to drop that alpha. But no one complained. But you, that's because you're too polite to point out my error. Don't be polite. Uh, there's a famous story about a professor. I think it was at Cornell. I won't mention his name. I'm protected guilty. He was uh, a very uh, able person, but he constantly made out to break errors when he gave a lecture. Right. So it got to the point where he thought, gee, I'm going to do with this. He said, the only reason I make an algebraic error is to see if the class is paying close attention. So when I make an error, it's not really an error. It's just I'm checking to see if you're paying close attention. And if you don't catch my error, I'm going to mark you down, all of you. Right? <laughs> On the other hand, if someone points out the error, I give you extra credit. So it's important that you point out my error. OK, anyway, so we're going to substitute this in here. And what are we going to get? Uh, when double dot, this is a time derivative, right? So that's going to generate a lambda squared. So we're going to have alpha bar lambda squared e to the lambda t plus omega alpha squared 1 minus q infinity uh, alpha bar e to the lambda t. And for the moment, first of all, we're going to set alpha naught equal to 0. But we'll later on come back and put it back in. If we do that, of course, then the right-hand side is zero. We cancel out the e to the lambda t. And then we, here's where people, I think, got a little 
excited. Maybe not. Some of you. There, there are two possibilities for this equation to be true. One is alpha bar equals zero. That's not very interesting. Okay. The, the more interesting one is when alpha bar is not a zero. So if it's not zero, then we can cancel that, right, in all terms. And now we have a, a condition on lambda. So this allows us to solve for lambda. So using higher mathematics, lambda squared is equal to minus omega alpha squared times 1 minus q infinity over q divergence. Right. So clearly, the character lambda depends on the sign S I G N of the right hand side. If Q infinity is less than Q divergence, then this is positive. But because of my sign, the whole thing is negative. Therefore, lambda squared is negative. Therefore, lambda is imaginary. We like imaginary numbers. Why do we like imaginary numbers? Because I look back up here. And lambda is imaginary, that means this motion is an oscillation in time. It's a complex oscillation with real imaginary parts. Actually, if you work it out in detail, it turns out to be a real number. But, you know, formally, it's a complex number. Okay? On the other hand, on the other hand, if Q infinity is greater than Q divergence, this whole thing is, this whole factor is negative. But that minus sign, the whole right hand side is positive. And so lambda squared is a real positive number. If I take the square root, I have two lambdas, one of which is plus something, real number, and the other one is minus something. The minus something represents a decaying oscillation of time, but the positive represents a growing, exponentially growing oscillation of time, which means the system's unstable. And after a short amount of time, who cares about the decay because it's going to be swamped by the exponential growth, right? So that's why this dynamic model tells you more about divergence than, <clears throat> than uh, static analysis. Moreover, if I'm right at divergence, right, if Q infinity or Q divergence is one, the right-hand side is zero and lambda is zero, which says that nothing's changing with time, right at divergence. That's why we can get away with a static analysis if we only want to know the divergence condition. But if we want to know what's happening below the divergent condition or above, then we need a dynamic model to tell us that. So that's why I gave you this homework, so you would think about that. Now, I want to say one other thing. Before I say anything else, let me pause, see if you have a question. Now, you're happy? Stockholm, are you happy? Yeah, very happy. Yeah, they're happy. I'm happy to. I'm happy that you're happy. Now let's go one step. I didn't actually actually do the next thing for the homework, but let's do it anyway. Uh, okay. Now I've got. Uh, uh, let's put alpha naught back in. All right. So now I'm going to write down the same equation. Where is it? Uh, okay. Oh, well, let's just look at equation one. I don't need to write it down again. Here's equation one, right? Now I'm going to put alpha naught back in. From everyone's had a course in differential equations sometime, <clears throat> is that right? So w with the right hand side uh, not zero, this is an inhomogeneous as opposed to a homogeneous difference equation, which it means that it has a homogeneous solution plus a particular solution, or if you're real, I don't know what they say in Sweden, but a homogeneous plus an inhomogeneous solution. Uh, inhomogeneous solutions uh, are obtained by art guesswork, but in this case it's trivial because it's clear that the right-hand side is a constant. So we just need to add a constant on the left-hand side that will balance this constant. Which, if it's a constant, that means the non-homogeneous particular solution is one where its time derivative is zero. And so I just balance these two terms, and that alpha solving this static equation gives me the particular solution, right? You agree with that? Good. So alpha, let, let me write this down. Uh, yeah. So alpha is now alpha homogeneous in English we usually say particular, although that's not a particularly good nomenclature. See a little, little pun. 
Italian. Yeah, even in Italian. So <laughs> they're not always that funny. But. So I don't know if you want to call this the alpha particular or alpha non homogeneous What do you want to call it? Non homogeneous. I like that better too. But if you read the mathematical literature, they usually say particular. So non. I'll just say non H. So homogeneous. What's homogeneous? Homogeneous is the solution I got when I set the right hand side to zero. So I have to use these two values of lambda. I'm just going to call them lambda one and lambda two. Uh, and and the and the the detailed character of those lambdas depends on solving this equation, right? But so this is now a one e to the lambda one t plus a two e to the lambda two t, where, the, where lambda one and lambda two are given by that equation, plus this uh, inhomogeneous solution, which is what? It's Q infinity over uh, Q divergence omega alpha squared alpha naught divided by omega alpha squared one minus Q infinity over Q divergence. Is that right? Yeah. All right. Again, it turns out by happenstance. Well, maybe not entirely happenstance, but anyway, they cancel, right? So, what does that mean? Um, well, remember what the lambdas are. If I'm below divergence, these terms are given an oscillatory solution, right? This is a constant. So it's going to oscillate, but it's not going to oscillate about a constant. Alpha is going to oscillate, but it's going to oscillate about a constant value. At, uh, if I'm Q infinity is greater than Q divergence, one of these is going to decay, the other one's going to grow, and when it begins to grow, of course, it'll swamp not only the decaying term, but it'll swamp the particular system too. And then if I'm right at Q infinity over Q divergence, well, <laughs> that one, that one neither grows nor decays, right? But uh, it's actually a constant term. Because the lambdas are zero, right? But this one blows up. So, again, by looking at this in detail, you get more information. By the way, how do I know A1 and A2? Not that I particularly want to, but at least not for the purpose of gain divergence. But if I really want to know what A1 and A2 were, how would I do? How would I do that? I use I have two initial conditions. You have to tell me what alpha is at t equals zero. You have to tell me what alpha dot is. How, how can you tell me that? Why well, you just make boundary conditions? If, if you're doing an experiment, you set them equal to whatever you choose to have when you start the experiment. Or say I start the experiment when uh, when nothing's happening, so I set alpha at t equals zero and alpha dot t equals zero. And if you work out the values on a two, you find that this is. As you would hope, the right hand side is a purely real number, even though it's composed of, of two terms that might be individually complex. Someone, I forgot who it was, I think it was someone in Stockholm, I, they didn't tell me how they did it, but they actually presented a graph of alpha versus time. And uh, I, I assume they put, took this difference equation and put it on MATLAB software and did a time simulation, which is fine. I mean, that's the other way you could, I mean, in this case, you can do it all analytically because it's so simple. But if you had a more complex set of equations, you'd probably do a time simulation using your favorite time integration routine. Runga Kutta is popular, and uh, any self-respecting bit of software like MATLAB would have a, a building routine where you give them the equation, you give them the initial conditions, and they will plot out the time as they well. Okay, I think that's all I wanted to say about homework number one. Any questions about any of that? Any questions from Stockholm? Hearing none. I think um, I think you yes. asked in the homework. Does uh, adding a non-zero oh I did ask change and what's the answer? Lambda. So the answer is no. The answer is no. Yeah. The answer is no. Uh, and and most people sort of fudged it in the sense that they say, well. I don't know. <laughs> well, after all, they, they sort of guess what the right answer was. But the way you really more rigorously show it is by doing this. 
Um, now, I get, well, I could go back to this, this question one for just a moment and say something else. Uh, remember, if we if we want to do a stack analysis, that corresponds to saying the alpha double dot term equals zero, right? So here, here we are. This stack analysis gives us effectively the particular solution, right? Or the non-homogeneous solution. And then, because this term is zero at divergence, when this way down, is obviously the, the case that alpha is going to get really large, like infinity. Or another way to think about it is, I set the right-hand side to zero, which is what real elasticians do when they do a divergence calculation using more elaborate models. They always set the non-homogeneous terms to zero. And then you look at this and say, well, alpha could be zero, but I'm interested in a more interesting case namely when alpha is not zero, and therefore its coefficient must be zero. And now if I have, uh, well, period, let me stop there. Now I'm going to go into something else, if you're ready for me to go into something else. Okay. Uh, by the way, this, this same kind of uh, reasoning arises in the second homework, <laughs> as you'll see if you've not seen that already. Okay. Now I'm going to go back to uh, to the simpler model, but then I'll quickly go up to the more complex model to generalize what we've done. Okay, this is the original spring model we had, right? Now I'm going to put a control surface, which also has a torsional spring, which attaches to the main surface. So this is the control surface. If you don't know why it's called control surface, I'll explain in a moment. If you will, this is the wing or airfoil. The control surface is called a control surface because it attempts to control the amount of lift or vertical force on the airplane. When you take off, you want more lift because you got to get off the ground. When you land, you may want to create negative lift because you want to slow down and you want the thing to sink. But you can, you're controlling the motion of the of the aircraft by changing the, the shape of the aerodynamic surface, right? You add this control surface. By the way, uh, this is not the way uh, the Wright brothers did it. The Wright brothers used aeroelasticity, although they didn't know there was such a thing then. Well, they knew the physical phenomenon, but they didn't use the word. The Wright brothers had wires attached to the wing. And they use those wires and, and their manual strength to elastically twist the wing and change the shape to change the amount of lift. They actually use their own static aeroelasticity to control their airplane. But later, a fellow named Glenn Curtis uh, <clears throat> thought this would be a better way to do it, which it is. And he got a patent on it. He got a patent on the idea of control surface. If he had had a monopoly on control service, well, he became a fairly rich man anyway, but he would have become vastly wealthy and it would have impeded the progress of development of airplanes. So uh, we went to the Supreme Court and they disallowed the patent on the grounds that it was too general and it would impede the progress. I mean, the whole idea of patent laws from a societal point of view is to impel progress, right? If you want to get someone a patent until they have the same to do brilliant things which will move the technology forward. But if he had controlled the patent on control service, we'd have a different situation. So anyway, control services are important. Okay. Now what can happen? <clears throat> well if I have these two and I blow air over it, I can now have this can diverge too, but now I have two equations of equilibrium. I have a torsional equation of equilibrium for the wing or airfoil. I have an element for control service. So I'll have two equations and two unknowns. Everything goes the same way, and, and you still look for it. Usually, if you're working for Boeing, a homogeneous solution because it takes less time and time is money and all that. Uh, you could put the inhomogeneous you know, terms in if you want to, to get the same answer, right? For the same reason as in the simple case. Um, or you could have a tab, which is yet another control service on the control service, right? So people. I mean, you could, you could have as many of these things as you want. In fact, if you look at the airplane when you land, next time you're flying into RDU, 
you'll see that at least on the larger airplanes, the wing comes apart, right? There are lots of control. So the whole thing is spreading out. Okay. Uh, but there's something else that can happen. I mean, diversions can still happen. And uh, in a real airplane, you may have a number of services, and you have to look at the reaction, do diversion to the whole system. But another thing can happen uh, other than divergence, and that is control surface. Reversal. And that's most easily understood if I now look at even simple model. Here's my airfoil again. Here's my torsional spring. Now, here's my control surface. I'll call this, uh, what did I call in the book? I think in the book I call this angle delta, and this angle alpha. Okay, so I rotate the control surface through angle delta. And by doing that, I will increase the lift on the wing, which is a good thing. I could also rotate the other way and decrease the lift. And I might want to do that too. But anyway, whatever I want to do, I rotate it and I change the lift. If I rotate it this way and I Increase the lift. This also the, the the aerodynamic pressure distribution on this will also create a moment which will twist the wing nose down, which will decrease the lift, right? And depending on the stiffness of the spring and the dynamic pressure, which is a measure of how strong the force is, I can reach a dynamic pressure. In fact, uh, for a given spring constant, I'll always reach a dynamic pressure of this high enough, such that the loss of the wing, the loss of lift because this airfoil wing twists down is greater than the gain I got from rotating the control surface. And, and there's a particular dynamic pressure at which these two things exactly balance, and there's no change in lift at all, no net change in lift. Well, what, that, what does that mean? That means the pilot once gets some change in lift, and he's at a certain dynamic pressure, and he can't get it, or she can't get it. Right? Or he's, he or she is at even higher dynamic pressure, and he, he thinks things are going to go one way, it goes the other way. If you're not aware of it, that could be a problem. Okay. So anyway, uh, so, so it's not an instability. It's not that. It's just a loss of effectiveness of the control surface due to air elasticity. Now, people have done various things to get away uh, get away from this problem, and we've actually done some experiments here too. And that is, you can put a control surface here, but you can also put a control surface there. So here's a trailing edge control surface, and here's a leading edge. control surface. And if you use these two in conjunction, you can go blow right by the so-called reversal dynamic pressure associated with just the training edge. And then all you need is a control system that keeps track of the logic and you split the signs on, on the logic so that the pilot does the pilot doesn't realize it, but the control service is actually moving in the opposite way he or she normally expects when the dynamic pressure is sufficiently higher low. And and we've done some one tone experiments here and we've written a couple of papers to show that this was fine. And so this is what people do. Now if you look at a modern, particularly a modern military airplane, it has control services on both the leading and trick edges, particularly if they want to have a lot of maneuverability. Because uh aerolasticity can give you greater maneuverability. Remember uh, in the case of uh, divergence, in fact yeah. Let me go back to this page. Um, look at this. Look at this expression. Uh, the alpha. If I stay below divergence, but I get fairly close, so that one minus q infinity over q del isn't zero, but it's a small number, then my alpha gets really big, which means my lift gets really big. So I can actually get enhancement of lift just because of 
Carolina Stores of Texas. I got to be really careful to make sure I get the sign as IGN, right? Otherwise, I may be trying to get more lift, and I'll get more lift would be in the wrong direction. So there's a whole literature on controlled source reversal. But like divergence, no self-respecting aerospace organization would ever really have a problem with it. It's something you have to calculate. It's something you have to plan for. But the, the theory usually is really pretty good. After all, it's a static problem. How, how bad can our answer be? And the answer is not very bad. Um, and it's also relatively simple to calculate as compared to a dynamics. Um, okay. See, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I. I will also tell you this. So that's that's that. Uh, but now let's go on, just so you will know that we can do other things other than a torque problem. I mean, we could you now. Okay. Yes. If actually try, uh, try, uh, you know, this reversal happens, okay. Anyway, in an aircraft, if we lose the attitude, it will lose the dynamic pressure. Yeah. So basically, it will come down to the point where uh, QD, uh, QD infinity is less than the reversal rate. So basically, it uh, won't affect anything. Yeah, I think the answer is yes. <laughs> oh, I didn't follow all of your question in detail. Yeah, you're you're going to lose effectiveness, but you're not you're not going to be in danger unless it turns out. Uh, you're in a fire airplane and someone's on your tail and you want to make a maneuver and you can't make it, someone's going to shoot you down. I mean, that's that's the practical danger. It's not that the, there's an inherent danger in the structural failure of your plane. Does that help? Basically, I was saying that if uh, a control software reversal happens, uh, finally our uh, dynamic pressure will decrease yes. and we will be uh, moved from that uh, Yes. So there will be no reversal. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm sorry. I, I, yeah, so help me. Actually, one one case when you might have problem when when you dive and you can pull out because you have zero effectiveness, then you 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 won't make. It. Even if we are not pulling out, we still uh, dive in until because of the attitude uh, drop. So our, uh, will well, if you, you, you can say if you die, then it doesn't really drop. You, you could just say that the altitude drop in and of itself is something that you want to avoid. I mean, sure, you'll eventually mm -hmm. get to the lower dynamic pressure, but you don't want that. You don't want to have to drop that much altitude to get to that mm -hmm. point. Okay. All right. Uh, let me draw another picture, two more pictures. We could do the same thing. For the structural model that you're looking at now in your homework problem, except now we would put a control surface on the back, right? And we have to allow for the fact that the control surface only goes over a portion way. Uh, you could probably analytically do the special case, and it is very special, <clears throat> where the control surface is uniform, goes all the way, but real control surface is something like that. So when you talk about uh, how you're going to do the case where the uh, first parameters of the wing change with span and community divergence, the same kind of considerations apply because you only have a partial span control surface. The other thing is, uh, <clears throat> I'll draw one more picture. Here's my fuselage. Oh, sorry. Here's my fuselage. And here's my wing on this side. And I'll have another wing on, on this side. And now, uh, these are supposed to be the same size wing, but my drawing skills aren't up to par. Uh, although you could do the case where they're not. But, uh, there's also something called rolling reversal. And in rolling reversal, you have a control surface on both sides, but you asymmetrically deflect them, right? One goes up and one goes down because you want to have a net zero lift change, but you want to create a, a moment about the fuselage axis so we can roll the airplane, so we'll rotate about that axis. And again, you can have rolling reversal. You can reach a dynamic pressure 
where the wing twists such that the effect of the control surface is negated. Now, in that case, it's a little more subtle uh, in that it turns out you have to allow, strictly speaking, the rolling rate to be another degree of freedom, even statically. And you have to include a, a, an equation of motion for the roll rate. Okay. Um, and so in, in this case, the, the inertia, even though it's inherently a, a, a phenomenon that doesn't change with time, except in the sense of, well, basically, things, nothing's oscillating, right? But it may be rolling at a constant roll rate. So it's a, in that sense, it's a statics problem. It's a statics problem in mathematics. The, the inertia, the, the, uh, the moment of inertia of the fuselage, as, a, as in the wing, will enter into the, the analysis. And one time, being able to roll a military airplane was a big deal. I don't know that such, you know, people don't have so-called dogfights anymore. You you stand off miles and shoot a missile at somebody you don't even see, except you look at them on your radar screen or something. So, uh, you know, <laughs> World War, well, I shouldn't say that. Anyway, it's not nearly as exciting. Uh, there's nothing much to watch. It's, it's almost like a video game. Um, well, I guess if you're getting shot at it, it's exciting. But, uh, <laughs> um, so this is all discussed in Chapter 2, but I don't plan to go into this in any great detail unless someone is fascinated with it. But you should at least be aware that the control service reversal of various sorts can occur. And so, and so you know, it's, it's something to do. And if you're a brand new engineer at the Boeing Company, they'll probably put you on divergence and reversal because they know you can't do too much harm, and the really <laughs> good people will be working on the dynamic problems. And then later on, when you have some experience, they might let you do it for them. Okay, let's see. Uh, I think that's all I wanted to say about that. Okay, now. Uh, let me pause for questions before I, because I'm, I'm about to change subjects. Any questions? Any more questions? Any questions in Stockholm? Question about um, homework two. Homework two, yeah. I, I, I yeah. have to to thing, yes. Um, in homework two, you, you talk about equilibrium, so does that mean that we need to do a static analysis? Yes. Good. And uh, do we need to consider um, alpha zero, or can we do, uh, last class you mentioned that there are two methods, like there is a method that we, we can consider alpha zero to be zero. Um, can we use that? Yeah. Did anyone understand that question? Because I didn't. Do you need to? <laughs> oh, do you need to consider alpha zero? Well, the answer is you need to consider alpha zero to the same extent you needed to consider it in homework number one. So you can you can uh, determine the divergent condition by saying alpha zero is zero, but then you have to think about what that means. Or if it's easier for you conceptually and physically to understand what's going on by including alpha zero, you might want to do that. Does that help you? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Other questions in Stockholm? Uh, there's one more question. Uh, this is about uh, uh, the equation of motion which we derived, and we got uh, uh, equal, but I mean, uh, plus or minus equal roots for lambda. Uh, is there a case where we have a model where we have where we can have Unequal roots, and uh, uh, is is such a model possible for the wing? Yeah, uh, yeah. So for a certain set of parameters, that would be possible, but not for all parameters. And that would be a very special case. Although, as you saw, when uh, when we did the homework number one, you had right at divergence, both lambdas were zero, right? Okay. Yeah. yeah. But, but for all the values of dynamic pressure, the two lambdas are distinct. Now, when I say distinct, they may be the same plus or minus 
right? But they were the same. I mean, there's a big difference between plus one and minus one. And they're both definitely not. Maybe you just leave the meta on. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay, now I get for the uh, group. Uh, we can go ahead, and I normally do this, go ahead and start discussing dynamics and talk about them. Or, uh, most part, we've been uh, delving into various levels of structural models and being fairly uh, cavalier, or at least simplistic about the aerodynamics. So the other thing I did is give you a peek. We won't do a full dress uh, rehearsal, but I can give you a uh, aerodynamics. So would you really have a aerodynamics, or would you like to stay with our aerodynamics for a while and talk about dynamics and water and other dynamic aerolysis? I'm easy. I can We have a, we have a sense of this. You want to do a play? Oh. Stockholm, do you have the people here in Durham talking about flutter? Want to talk about flutter? Yeah, it's okay. Okay, silence. Okay, we'll talk about it. Now, now, start out with us. Did you buy this shirt when you were in school? Did you buy this shirt when you were in school? I, I mean, this is dynamic, right? Um, ah, always. Get to put that alpha in. Okay, there it is. This is equation one again. Now, what is flutter in the context of this equation? Well, you can define it in various ways, but I would define it as when I when I assume alpha equals alpha bar e to the lambda t. Lambda now, in general, can be a real part. Plus I times an imaginary part, right? What we found for this equation was either the lambdas are both real. That was when I was above the divergence condition. Or they were both pure imaginary when I'm below the divergence condition. So this math model says, below the divergence condition, for some sort of initial conditions, this thing just oscillates. It actually oscillates about a non-zero value if you have alpha null. And above the divergence condition, one of the roots changes exponentially with time. The other one, well, they both change exponentially with time, but one is growing and one is decaying. They're not oscillating though, right? I mean, when I'm above divergence, there's no oscillation back and forth. Once I start in one direction, I just keep going, or if it's decaying, I just decay back to zero without crossing the axis, right? If I plot alpha versus time, if uh, I saw with some initial condition and I'm below, uh, the uh, divergence value. This thing just oscillates back and forth with a constant amplitude. This is Q infinity over QD less than one, right? On the other hand, if I'm above divergence, that's what happens. But the point is, and from the dash line, they don't oscillate. So that's what happens. Is this flutter? Nope. No. So how can we make our simple model flutter? 
Well, it's really hard, actually. <laughs> Almost impossible. But it turns out if I allow this system to have both plunging as well as the torsional degree of freedom, then flutter is possible even with the simple aerodynamics we've used to analyze divergence. So that's one possibility. There's another possibility, and that's the following. Note that this, this analysis is really adequate for divergence, but if I were truly interested in dynamics, not necessarily flutter, but just dynamics, I've left out a really important physical ingredient, which is poorly understood and poorly modeled almost universally. I've left out damping, right? I've left out damping. So the normal way of including damping in, say, this model, all, uh, lots of other models as well, is I just throw it in. Just throw it in. And how do I throw it in? How do I include damping? When you say damping, are you referring to aerodynamic damping, or the damping of the like the material structure. properties of the Excellent question. The question before the house is, am I talking about structural damping, or am I talking about aerodynamic damping? And again, the answer is yes. Definitely yes. Okay. Uh, so let's go on. How do I, how, how, how do, I'll, I'll be very egocentric. Mm -hmm. How do I include that? <laughs> well, the normal way is the following. I'll put alpha double dot, and then I add two. By tradition, there's a two. We can talk about why we put two in. Zeta sub alpha, omega sub alpha, alpha dot. I need a first time derivative to get dissipation in my system. Plus alpha squared one minus Q infinity over two divergence. Alpha equals Q infinity over Q divergence. I might do it in my own page. Not very good. Omega alpha squared alpha naught. So I just throw it in. That's the way. That's the way we throw it in. If this is structural damping, then I know zeta sub alpha. This coefficient, which if you look closely, is non-dimensional. That's one reason we put the alpha omega alpha in. We want to make this non-dimensional. Uh, from a hundred years of <laughs> building things, uh, we know that zeta alpha typically is 0.01. It turns out in turn machinery, it can act with almost 0 0.001. On the other hand, uh, in some other machinery, like an automobile, it might be at the height of 0.1. But a typical airplane structure, not, not, the, not the jet engine, but the airframe, 0.01 In fact, the government, when you do a flutter analysis, at least in the United States, maybe different elsewhere in the world, they will allow you to assume a zeta alpha as large as I think 0.02. Yeah. And so, you know, you're putting an expensive airplane, and uh, it's going to cost you a lot of money to show that no flutter occurs. And if it turns out the flutter speed that you predict for zeta alpha equals zero is Mach 0.8, and you need 0.82, and then you put in the damping value of 0.02, and that gets you up to 0.83, you've had a good day, right? I mean, so this can this can be not just a question of technology, a question of substantial sums of money. So anyway, but zeta sub alpha is number one. Now. So that's how you represent structural damping. How do we represent aerodynamic damping in some way? Except that when someone has to run a, an aerodynamic code, which we haven't really talked about, you said you didn't want to talk about it yet, so I'm not going to talk about it, except to tell you that someone runs an aerodynamic code and prescribes a certain oscillation of my airflow and computes the equivalent aerodynamic zeta sub alpha. For a small Mach number, that Z sub alpha will be a positive number, indicating it adds to the stability of the system, adds to the damping. And by the way, often it, that aerodynamic damping is much larger than the structural damping. But there will come a time, 
or they will become a Mach number. When the Mach number gets high enough, this zeta alpha is a function of Mach number, and it'll go from being a positive number to a negative number. At some point, it's zero. And so if I have no structural damping at all, or I assume that, I can compute a flutter boundary by simply running the aerodynamic code for some oscillation and watching how the aerodynamic damping changes as a function of Mach number and look for the crossing from positive to negative value. In fact, in turbine machining, yeah, there's some turbine machines that people have. Turbine machinery, typically, that's all they do most of the time. Why? It turns out that the mass ratio is such, and we'll talk about why this is later on, in turbine machinery, that there's very little significant aerodynamic coupling between the torsional motion and the plunging motion, so you can look at them individually. So you look at one mode at a time, because it, there may be multiple modes in the turbine machinery place, so you look at one mode at a time and run the aerodynamic code and check for the change in sign of the, the aerodynamic damping. Okay, But in airframes, wings, there's a fair amount of coupling between modes, aerodynamic and otherwise. And there, you can get flutter uh, of a different sort that has actually very little to do with air damping. In fact, often, as a first cut, you ignore the aerodynamic and the structural damping altogether. And if you do that, and if you've got enough margin, <laughs> you might say, oh, that's good enough. Although normally you would include the full effect of the air damage, even in coupled mode play. So people then distinguish between single mode flutter due to a loss, if you will, or a change in sign of aerodynamic damping and coupled mode flutter, the simplest being two modes, right? Coupled mode flutter due to the interaction of two or more modes. And the simplified aerodynamic damping, uh, certainly the simplified aerodynamic force model we've been using so far is probably adequate to give you a ballpark number or <clears throat> the Mach number which, uh, or the dynamic pressure of which flutter uh, of this kind will occur. Ballpark means you don't need to be off by no more than a factor of two on dynamic pressure. That's not good enough if you're building a real airplane, but it's good enough to perhaps give some illustration of what's going on. And it might even be good enough to uh, to do some preliminary analysis of the real airplane. But, so if you find out, you know, you're you've got a margin between the dynamic pressure you expect versus the mar versus the dynamic pressure you need to get flutter by a factor of five, I mean you know, why why run a CFD code see if it's really <clears throat> 3.6 Okay, so. Professor? Yes. Yes. When you talk about uh, the interaction between two, mo two or more modes, uh, like, so how are these modes distributed? They are very far from each other or close to each other or uh, are they bending, bending or bending torsion or? Oh, that's, or, that's an excellent question. And you asked it beautifully just the way you and I discussed it before class. Thank you. So, yes, we're going to now look at both bending and torsion. And the classic coupled uh, phenomenon is associated with the coupling between one bending mode and one torsion mode. In fact, there's sort of a folklore out there that says, oh, it's always got to be a couple. It doesn't have to be. Two bending modes can couple, two torsion modes can couple. But it's more likely than not. The most common coupling is between bending and torsion. So, yes, we're going to look at the coupling between bending and torsion, and we're going to go back to our uh, this model. By the way, we could also oops, thank you. We could also I'm not going to do it because I don't see the need for it at this point. We could also go back to this model, right? And then we could put another spring here. So th this this model and this model will be qualitatively the same, but 
let's go ahead and do this one, right? We don't need to do that one. This one's in the book if you want. This one's in the book if you want to look at the discussion of the book. But let's look at this model. And we're going to assume that there is an axis, I'll call it the y-axis, which is also the elastic axis. What do I mean by elastic axis? I mean that the motion of this wing can be thought of as a bending of this axis, right, in and out of the book, in and out of the paper, as well as a twisting about that axis. Now, more complex wing shapes don't always have an elastic axis. And so at some point, we did to discuss what happens for more complicated models. But this is a good place to start. It's, it's more realistic than this, but not the ultimate <laughs> in terms of what you might, might do. So first thing you have to do is develop the equations of motion, right? How are we going to do that? Hamilton's principle of Lagrange's equation. And that's, that's what we know, right? It, that's what we're always going to do. Okay. So to do that, we need to write down the form of potential energy, kinetic energy, and the virtual work associated with aerodynamic forces. OK, so now the uh, potential energy is still going to be 1 half the integral over the span of gj d alpha dy squared dy. That takes care of the torsional motion. But then we need to add in the bending of this axis, which is just like the bending of a beam, right? Just like the bending of a beam. So if we're going to add in one half, the integral from zero to L, of EI, which is the bending stiffness, times the derivative, second derivative of H with respect to Y squared dy, where H is the, um, the bending deformation. So if I think of taking a cross section like so, and I look over here, here's my elastic axis. I'm now looking edge on into the into the wing. And so H is is how much this deflects up and down at a given value of Y. And of course alpha is how much rotation occurs about that axis. So here's H. And by tradition H is taking the positive down. Which is not a good choice, but it's the choice that's been used for as long as I can remember. And there's no point in our trying to change it because then you're just confused when you read the rest of the literature. <coughs> okay. What about uh, kinetic energy? It's one half. It's always one half. But now I'm going to write in a different way. I'm going to write it as a double integral over y and x, where x is in the chordwise direction. Remember, the flow is this way, right? Of uh, the mass, and this mass is mass per unit area. Mass per unit area. Otherwise, the density of the material finds the thickness, if this is a solid plate, which isn't always. I mean, usually it's more complex than that. But we'll get to that later. But think of it as a solid sheet of metal, but maybe varying thickness. So the mass per unit area is the is the density of the material times the thickness times I'll call it dw dt squared dx dy, where w is the displacement at any point on this wing, not just on the elastic axis, but any other point. And uh, since it's squared, I don't need to worry too much about the sign I have yet, but just to be difficult, no, that's not right. just to be, make life more interesting, I'm going to take W as positive up. Remember, I'm taking H as positive down. I'm going to take W as positive up. Uh, why not? I can, I can take W as positive down if you want me to. But I think I wrote the book on W as positive up. Okay, if W is positive up, then what is W? First of all, W depends on X y and time, right? But I should be able to write w of x, y, and t in terms of alpha and h. I better be able to do that, otherwise I'm not going to be able to make much progress. So how does w relate to h and, and alpha? Well, first of all, there's a minus h, because if there's only h, and this is a linear model, you know, that, 
That's, that's what it is. But how, then I have an additional effect due to alpha. And if I'm measuring x, let's measure x from, from this elastic axis point. We can measure it anywhere you like. But. Oh, sorry about that. Thank you. Um, then, uh, let's see. If x is positive and alpha is positive, the contribution from alpha to w is in the opposite direction as w, so it's minus x times alpha. X is x times maybe tangent alpha or something, but anyway, but for small alpha, and this is a linear model, it's, it's alpha, right? So I need to take this and put it in here and work out the consequences. I'm sorry. We need to take this equation and put it in here and work out the consequences, which we can do because we now have an explicit dependence on x, right? And therefore, if we integrate out x and leave something which only depends on y, just like the potential energy. So I'll let you do that. I don't need it. And then similarly, for the virtual work, this is due to the aerodynamic forces. And uh, I'm, the usual way of representing aerodynamic forces when we do a full up parallelic analysis is to represent them in terms of the aerodynamic pressure distribution, the force per unit area. So the virtual work then will be this pressure integrated over dx and dy times a virtual change in small w, right? And by implication, I'm taking this pressure to be positive up, right? It's really the pressure difference. There's a pressure on the top surface of the wing, and there's a pressure on the bottom surface of the wing. And this is really, it's really delta P, right? It's the pressure on the bottom surface minus the pressure on the top surface. And again, uh, I have delta W here, so I have to compute delta W, but I can do that really from this equation. Delta small w is what? It's minus del H, right? Minus X times del alpha. X cannot have a virtual change. X just tells me where I am on the plate. It's just a coordinate. Thank you. But alpha. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I like this. Thank you. Yeah. Not yet. Somewhere there. There. Alpha can have a virtual change, right? Alpha can have a, but X cannot. Because if I'm in a certain position on the wing, I can't make a virtual change in that. I'm not allowed to. Only thing that, only thing that has a virtual change is something that involves the, the motion or possible motions, almost a potential motion, because that would be confusing. Possible motions. So, with this information and this information, I accept it this in here. And I have now three integrals only related to y. And then I plug this into Hamlin's principle. And out will come uh, some differential equations, uh, one for h and one for alpha. And it turns out, because of the way I have uh, set up this system and chosen the elastic axis as my basis for these coordinates h and alpha, there will be no coupling in the step experiment, that is the terms that arise from potential energy, but there will be coupling between h and alpha in the so-called inertia terms, which come from the kinetic energy, as well as possibly the, uh, possibly the uh, area of the Okay? And these will be uh, partial difference equations, right? Because H depends on Y and T, alpha depends on Y and T, but I've explicitly now taken into account all the dependence on X by virtue of assuming that the motion is this form. The more general assumption, of course, would be to let W just be some arbitrary function X, Y, and T, uh, but we're not quite ready to do that. Um, I think I'll stop here because, I mean, I could, there's much more to be said about this, but it's going to take more than more than five minutes. So let me stop here and see if there are any questions up to this point. But this is going to be the model. And we're going to end up with some, some partial depth equations in Y and T.
But guess what? Well, let me say one other thing, and then I'll take questions. I mean, what are you thinking about your question? What are we going to do with H, a function of Y and T? Guess what we're going to do? We're going to say it's some um, Q super H sub N of T times psi super H N some function of Y, right? <laughs> Yeah, we're going to do what we did before, right? For static, same thing we're going to do again. And so that will lead to ordinary difference equations for these coefficients. And then from there, we can do a dynamic stability analysis and all that good stuff. Yes, sir? What is the difference between the lower n and the super n? Maybe I. Uh, this is h. Ah, okay. And this is h. And this is n. I probably should use ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. I can do this. <laughs> How about that? Okay. That that make it a little clearer. And the same thing for out, right? And then um, we can use our simple aerodynamic theory, which we've already used for divergence, or we can enhance it a little bit. And just to make life interesting and provide a little more realism, we'll enhance it a little bit. But I'll talk about that next time. So I'm going to sneak in a little aerodynamics anyway. Not, not too much, just enough to make it more interesting. Any other questions here in Durham? Any questions? Any questions? Yes, uh, the question is about Homo 2. I also mailed you the question. Uh, when I'm solving for the fourth part, uh, in that the functions are not given for GJ and uh, C and E. To solve for the last problem, I think I need the functions. Are you going to interpret? Can you repeat it, please? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, give us one more try. Yeah, yeah, okay. So when uh, when we have to solve for the fourth part in the question, where the properties, wing properties are variable, did you get it? Are you asking about homework? Yeah, I'm asking about homework too. Oh, well, yeah, well, yeah, okay, homework. I, okay, we're now focused. Homework number two, right? Oh, uh, okay. So I'm asking about homework too, in that in the fourth part, we have variable property wing. Now the pro the variation of the property is not given. So when when I have to use the orthogonal orthogonality of the uh, uh, eigenmodes, okay. uh, I need the function to actually calculate what the ans will be. Yeah. But they are not given, the properties as a function of y, so I'm stuck. I hear that. Uh, let me give you the answer, and I hope this will uh, ease your mind. Um, when you do the variable property wing, you can just leave your result in terms of integrals of those mode shapes. Uh, you don't have to explicitly work them out, okay? That's point one. Point two is, in the homework, I asked you explicitly to look at what happens when you only have one mode. When you have only one mode, then you can define those integrals over mode shapes as some symbol, just to simplify the the representation. And you should be able to explicitly compute a formula, an analytical formula, which will involve those integrals for the That's divergence the dynamic pressure. And that formula will look just like the spring formula. It'll look just like the uh, one for the constant case, except it'll involve some integrals of gj and whatever. But, okay, okay. but we usually have an assistant to do those integrals for us, except in this course. But in your case, for this homework, uh, I'm not asking you to evaluate those integrals unless you particularly want to. If you want to evaluate those integrals, you're right. You would have to explicitly say gj is some function of y and, and work it out. But I didn't ask you to do that because, uh, you know, that's that's something you can ask somebody else to do. That's a problem for uh, someone who isn't getting paid as much as you are. Okay? <laughs> okay, thanks. All right, you're welcome. That reminds me of something. Uh, let me see what I'm thinking about. Um, let's go back to divergence. And remember this equation, oops, I get the, the equation for the uh, particular solution. So let's look at that. Alpha particular, oh, let me write it here so I'll save, I'll, I'll save a little. Uh, uh, homework number one, which will carry over to homework number two, by the way. 
uh, alpha particular or non-homogeneous is Q infinity over Q divergence divided by one minus Q over Q divergence times alpha naught, right? Now, this formula sometimes is used far beyond its origins. <laughs> what do I mean by that? Um, if you think about it, if I if I set the denominator equal to one, I'm sort of ignoring the the feedback from the structural deformation on the aerodynamics. That is, if I ignored if I just took the aerodynamic moment from the aerodynamics group and applied it as a moment to the structure and gave the structure group the task of computing alpha, they would get the numerator. That's what they get. The denominator is what you get when you include the air elasticity effect. So sometimes what people do is the following. If I've got a real airplane wing, a real airplane wing, uh, I tell the aerodynamics group, you know, give me the aerodynamic forces acting on, on the plane. I hand those off to the structure group. I say, give me the structural response. And they get an answer. And then I take that answer and divide it by 1 minus Q over Q divergence, where I, the air elasticity group tells me what the divergence is for the real one. And I use this formula as a first guess as to what would happen if I did a full up air elastic analysis. So this formula is sometimes used. Uh, as a simple way of, of estimating how big this alpha is, even if I haven't quite reached divergence, provided that some air elastician has worked very hard to come to work to the divergence. And it works pretty well. And it, it, again, in a preliminary design setting, that, that might be okay. Before it's all done, they'll probably do a full up air elastic analysis. But if I'm looking at a thousand different possible configurations, and preliminary design to decide which one I'm really going to build. You probably don't want to do a full up air elastic analysis for a thousand different configurations. Although computers keep getting bigger and faster. So anyway, so this formula uh, it, often if you if you see a book on aircraft design, there'll be something like this. And, and, and they say where Q divergence is given by the air elasticity group. <laughs> okay. All right, we'll see you on uh, Tuesday next. And in the meantime, work hard on the second homework problem. And if you have further questions, uh, my fee is still very reasonable for answering those questions. Uh, so feel free to shoot those to me. Where is the seminar tomorrow? In this room. Yeah, the seminar.